Praise God. Amen. So it's great to have John Edwards and his wife Trish with us. Uh, John is the only man I ever talked to in the grave. <laughs> he rang me one time. I was in Huntington. Uh, yeah, I was in Huntington. And he was in a coffin in Dublin, I think it was. So I had a great conversation with him. <laughs> yeah, so just before John comes to share, Mary just reminded me I had a few things to say on the plumb line day. Uh, so 10 euro, but we're meeting at 7.45 here at the church. It's important, yeah? The bus will be, yeah, in the morning, so Saturday morning. And also just uh, to bring a packed lunch. Teas and coffees will be provided and uh, stuff like that. But bring a packed lunch. There's no shop next door to the church. So for those that are coming, you remember that, 7.45. 7.45, we don't want to be missing the bus. <laughs> Amen, I think that's it. So yeah, John and Trish, it's a blessing to have you. A real evangelist, a real God's using him in these days to really impart. I really noticed with John. John prayed for me one day here, and I actually genuinely thought I was getting retired from being a pastor, and I was going to be an evangelist. <laughs> genuinely, I was like, for a few days, I could feel that anointing so strong on me. So... It'll happen someday, but uh, not yet. So God bless you. Thanks, John. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you all. See some familiar faces. Nice to see you all and some new people as well. So God bless. What a packed house this morning. Praise God. I mean, I tell you, since the last time I was here, something something has shifted here. There's like a, a new, fresh move of God in this building. Amen. So praise God for that. So you see, you see our cross and my speaker over here. That cross is the cross. When I walked the length and breadth of Ireland and Britain and walked across America, that cross, we went coast to coast with in, in America with it. The first time I ever carried it was in the Orkney Islands up in, off the north of Scotland. And at nine o'clock, one freezing cold March morning, God had told me to take the cross to the nations and take the gospel to the lost. And we made that cross. It was still sticky varnish on it from uh, varnishing it but, uh, the, the night before. And I stood in a place called Stromness on the Orkney Islands. I picked up the cross, put it on my shoulder. The pastor was there. One lady from his congregation was there. My friend who drives with me, he was there. And there was a newspaper man there. I picked the cross up. I put that cross on my shoulder. As I did so, it was 9 a.m. in the morning. As I put the cross on my shoulder and I took the first step, there was a terrific flash of lightning and crash of thunder at the same time. And the heavens opened and snow fell on the road and the path turned white in front of me. And the lightning knocked the, knocked the electricity out on the entire island. The pastor's wife was at home, looked at, looked at the clock and she said, John Edwards has just started walking. God came down and that night in the meeting, the Holy Ghost fell in the meeting, um, and everybody in the room, everybody, it was about this amount of people, everybody fell on the floor without me touching anybody. For four hours, like they were plugged into electricity, the Holy Ghost baptized every one of them in the Holy Ghost. And they got up and they went out preaching the gospel on the streets, and uh, the pastor still talks about it this day as the day the Holy Ghost came to his church. It was a powerful visitation. And then we took that cross to the nations. That, that boom box, I have that because I went to a church up in the north of, Carl, up north of California. Somebody flew me up there in 1999, 2000, around there somewhere. And I, they drove me into this church. And as we drove in, we drove in under like a canopy of the presence of God. I nearly got, I, I, it was just unbelievable, deep, deep, holy presence of God that we drove in. It was, it was a resident the, 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 my friend and his wife who were in the front of the car, they turned around to me. They said, this is the surprise we were telling you about, John. We have, we have, have a visitation of God that stayed with us now for months. And I went into the church and they were playing worship on a speaker, something like that. And the people were in the church just on their faces praying. And uh, I met the pastor there. The pastor's name was Bill Johnson. And uh, from Bethel, there was Bethel Church in Northern, in Redding, California. Before anybody knew who they were, there was only a couple of hundred people in the church. And they had, they had revival in that church. So no matter what anybody might say about it these days, I was there when it begun. And they were preaching on crossing the Jordan into the promised land. And it was a terrific, 
uh, resident presence of God in that place. And that's what we pray for, amen. So I carry the cross and I bring my boombox with me and we do worship everywhere we go. And uh, Revival Ireland that Dermot mentioned is a team of evangelists that we have. That uh, My ministry is called Walking Free. And, uh, but we, we decided during the lockdown to establish a group of evangelists who would go around the nation and preach the gospel. And we have quite a few evangelists now. We have a couple of dozen evangelists and we meet and we pray and we worship and we reach out in different cities all over Ireland and Northern Ireland. Mostly Ireland, but we will be doing Northern Ireland as well. And God is really moving up. We're seeing hundreds, maybe even thousands of people touched and saved by the Lord now. Amen. So, um, yeah, praise God. Listen, I've got my, one of my books down at the back of the, of, of the hall. It's called For Heaven's Sake. And uh, in this book, it's part two of my testimony, really. But in this book, I myself had a visitation during one of the toughest times of my life where I was almost suicidal as a Christian. And one night when I went to bed, I had a visitation by God. I got raptured up into heaven for three hours. I met two angels and God spoke to me. I will never forget it. And it felt like five minutes. But when I woke, when I woke up out of, this, out of the thing, out of the experience, Tricia was in bed beside me and she woke up and looked at me and she said, like, the glory of God was on me, didn't you, honey? And... Um, uh, it was just phenomenal. So that story's in here, and my walk across America's in here, some of the miracles that happened, and other things. The reason I mentioned that book is not a penny of it goes into my pocket. I'm traveling around presently to all the 32 counties in Ireland. I'm a recovered drug addict and alcoholic, and I have such a huge burden for the, the homeless, the lonely, the broken, the abused, sexually, physically, mentally, and those living on the streets. And I'm traveling around to every county in Ireland, going on the streets, giving them sleeping bags, giving them hats and gloves and hand warmers, if you know what hand warmers are, and uh, making sure they uh, bind them tents if necessary, bind them hot food. And then I have literature like this, which has addicted homeless, do you want help? Read this. This is the addresses of all the Christian rehabilitation programs in Ireland, Northern Ireland, and in the United Kingdom. Rehabilitation programs that will take these guys. I was an addict for 24 years. I've been sexually, physically, mentally abused. I've been in mental homes at least 10 times. I've been in padded cells and straitjackets. I've had a liver transplant and hepatitis C. I've had cancer twice. I've had six operations down my neck to um, fix up bursting veins from hep C. I've had 41 pints of blood transfused into my body over the last few years just to keep me alive. And uh, God's, God's healed me of every single thing that went wrong with me. And I stand here today as a 68-year-old man, uh, completely fit, completely well, and on fire for God more than I've ever been. And I'm going, to, I'm going to go around Ireland, every county in Ireland, and I'm going to keep doing it again and again and again and again till I reach homeless people all over this nation. Because we've got to do it. They're dying on our streets. And some of our churches, not this church, because we had a tremendous day yesterday, some of our churches are sitting by in holy huddles, like clubs, enjoying the presence of God when people within their arm's reach are dying. And I'm determined to use the rest of my life. God's given me a new liver. So I've, been, I've had a liver transplant, so I've been delivered. <laughs> All right. I have a new liver, and I, while I have the strength in me, so I was coming in here, and uh, somebody thought that somebody thought that I was Andy's father. <laughs> so, so uh, I thought, oh my God, who <laughs> would have a child like that? <laughs> I suppose all things work together for the good. But there you go. Uh, God works in mysterious ways. There's wonders to perform, Andy. Amen. So I'm only kidding. So uh, Andy and I, Pastor Andy and I, are friends, and we, you know, we can have a laugh together. So. Um, yeah, so, so uh, although parts of me are younger than you, my liver's only 17. <laughs> yeah, so, and my teeth are about seven or eight. So on average, I'm about 53 or four, somewhere around there. So, you know, life is tough. I've had all those things happen to me, but I don't stand here today as a consequence of those things. I stand here today as a consequence of what Jesus Christ did to me in 1987 in a full gospel business meeting and a Christian meeting, and I got zapped by the power of God, and my life has never been the same from that moment. Amen. 
So those selling these books, our ministry is called Walking Free. The website's on the back, walkingfree.org. I want to buy sleeping bags for every homeless person I meet if they need it. I want to give them blankets. I want to help them. We were down in a family's house, I won't mention their names, in a place called Moy Ross the other day. They're a well-known gangster family. And we went into the house. I know the family. I went in. The house is completely broken. There were a couple of hundred rubbish bags strewn all over the place. There was three broken beds in the house. There was a seven-day-old baby in the house. And I sat with that baby in my arms, looking at that child, thinking, what kind of a future will this child have? And I felt such a sense of responsibility for that kid and all the children of the land. If I meet that child in 15 years' time, and if it's already begun to take drugs, if it's in a gang and has joined the rest of that particular family in the gang warfare they're doing with another family, if, I join, if that child goes in there, I am partly responsible for doing that. Amen. Amen. Because I had the opportunity of doing something. So we got some friends together. We threw, I put 300 quid down, and I got my friends and said, put some money towards it. Let's buy a giant skip. Let's get a gang and go around and clean that house out. Let's get them three beds. Let's get them wardrobes. Let's get them blankets, new blankets. Let's get them clean sheets. Let's get the, the girls and the fellas are in. Girls are better than fellas. And let's clean the whole place from top to bottom and disinfect it that that child will have the best chance of growing up to be a good baby. That is evangelism. It's not just spending a couple of hours on a Saturday afternoon preaching the gospel. And we probably prayed for between 30 and 40 people yesterday for salvation. I prayed with eight people myself for salvation yesterday. Tremendous encounters of God. But real evangelism is the follow-up. It's the church in action. It's putting their hands in their pockets to help the people where you're living. There's old people in Kilkenny at the moment that are lonely and cold in their houses, afraid to put the electric on because of the price of the electric. You know, these people need a knock on the door. Say, are you warm enough? Are you got everything you need? Do you have food in the house? Some old people I've called into, they have not been able to put a light bulb in because they're afraid of standing in a chair in case they fall off and break a hip or something. And they lie there because nobody calls to them. And they maybe die on the floor. So we call into old people's houses. We put light bulbs in. We cut their grass in the garden. We clean up the rubbish from their house. We pray with them and lead them to Jesus. Amen. During lockdown, I started off a food bank. And um, I broke all the rules. You know, I, I did. And I've had a liver transplant. My immune system is compromised. You know, we were very wise in how we did it. Nobody who was sick was allowed to come anywhere near us. I mean, I called into one old lady's house. She was 82 years of age. And I had a big bag of messages for her. And she looked through a little peephole in the, wind, in, in the door. And she opened the door and she came out. And I said, ma'am, I, I kept my distance. We socially distanced. And I said, ma'am, I said, I've got a bag of food for you. She said, well, I don't really know. I don't really need food. I said, I know you don't, ma'am. I said, it's just an excuse to talk to you. I said, we want to give it to you. I said, can, can we just leave this in the doorstep for you? And she said to us, she said, oh, she said, would you mind coming in and leaving it on the kitchen table? I said, well, I said, we're just aware of the, 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 the pandemic. And so she said, yeah, I'll stand by. Come in and leave it on my kitchen table. So I come in and I put it on her kitchen table in her kitchen. And um, I said, there's the meat. You can put that in the fridge and there's other stuff in your cupboard. She said, would, you, would your friends come in and spend a few minutes with me? I said, we will, of course. She said, we can go into my living room and we can socially distance in different chairs. She said, I've not spoken to anybody for three months. There was a church, two churches, just around the corner. I'll leave that with you. Um, Father, I help you as I preach this word this morning. That you would help us, Father, in Jesus' mighty name, to open our hearts and to receive the word that you have for us. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning. Uh, and I, I just ask you, please, to, you know, the trouble with some evangelists is they come into churches and they preach guilt and condemnation on people to try and get them to go out in the streets. Please don't ever feel that from me. That's not the job of an evangelist. We're not meant to be beaten to go into the streets. The Apostle Paul says it's the love of God that compels us. 
is to get in touch with the love we have in our hearts that compels us to go and reach people. Not, not to do it like works because somebody has told you to do it. Wrong motivation. You're better off not doing it at all. When I come over here today, Trish and I live in a motorhome as we're traveling around the place. And uh, as I come over here, uh, we, 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 um, we had a, a retreat in Scotland with addicts, a recovery retreat with 80 addicts two weekends ago. They're all born again now, baptized in the Holy Ghost and walking in freedom. And we do those retreats regularly with the addicted. We have gangsters that come in to be former murderers. We work with former paramilitaries from both sides. In America, we work with the mafia. We work with people helping them to turn their lives around. We've had murderers staying in our house. In fact, one time recently, I had a, um, a certain person staying in the house who was responsible for a lot of deaths. And they were in the house, and Tricia, and um, this time I hadn't told Tricia their testimony. And Tricia Trisha says, them, what's your testimony? And I think, oh my God, I forgot to tell her. You know, so he starts telling her, you know, her testimony. And she's calm, calm as anything. Trisha says, oh, is that right? That's very interesting, she says. She says, and she says, you want a cup of tea? And she vanished out in the kitchen. So I went out in the kitchen and said, sorry about that, darling. You know, I should have told you his testimony. But walking over the Yorkshire Moors where I live with this particular person, explaining about the cross and the blood of Jesus and forgiveness, that person bowed and accepted Christ into their hearts. And that person now works the opposite way, helping people who are involved in crime and violence, helping turn their lives around. In America, I lived with a guy in London once, I was telling Pastor Andy, I lived with a guy in London once who was an assassin with the Mexican Mafia. I shared a house with him. He became a Christian on death row in San Quentin prison. And I went to California with him, and I said to him in a conversation one day, by the way, I said to him, when you're with me, please don't backslide. I said, you know, I don't want a former assassin backsliding in my company. <laughs> Not the healthiest of company. But while we were over there, I said, hey, how about we go and meet your boss in the Mafia? I said, do you think that he'd listen to us? So a long story short, we called around to the top man of the Mexican Mafia. And we knocked on the door, and my friend obviously knew him. He had been mentored by him. We went in, and there was a Christian conference for drug addicts and gangsters and gangbangers, you know, people from gangs, in San Diego. So the guy agreed to come down with us. We brought him down to San Diego, and at that meeting, a girl came in the stage, and she said, she said I know there's La Emi. La Emi is the Mexican mafia. She said, I know there's La Emi people here. She didn't know the boss was here. So I'm sitting here in the seat, and the boss of the Mexican Mafia is sitting beside me. Then the art, the assassin, is sitting beside him. And then a guy called Blinky Rodriguez, the kickboxing champion of California, is beside him. And his wife's beside him. She's the female kickboxing champion of Orange County in California. I'm looking down, and I'm saying, crikey, Lord, I'm keeping, I'm keeping worse company now than what I ever kept in my life. And a girl came up on the stage and she said this. She said, she said, I know there's some mafia people here. She said, I want you to know that I forgive you for killing my brother. Because God has forgiven me for all the things that I've done in my life. When she said that, the boss of the mafia fell on his knees beside me and repented before God. He died about two years ago. He spent the last 15 years going around America preaching to tens of thousands of gang members, getting them to turn their lives to Jesus. Everybody is reachable. Okay, I'm reading from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'll keep an eye on my time here. What time am I finished here at, Andy? How long more have I got? It's 10 past 12. What time do we finish usually? Another half an hour, sir. Okay. Right, so I'm just going to skip through this. In 1 Samuel uh, chapter 3, in verse 1, it says, Now the boy Samuel ministered the Lord to the Lord before Eli. The word of the Lord was rare and precious in those days, and there was no frequent or widely, or widely spread vision. The people at that time in the world were living without vision. They were living without vision uh, that was attached to the word of God because the word of the Lord was rare and precious in those days. So, and I'm in this church this morning. I can sense the presence of God in this place. I can sense a hunger and a thirst for people to do something to serve God in this place. So that's the context we're talking about. The word of the Lord was rare. And there was a huge lack of vision in the neighborhood. So at that time, Eli, whose eyesight had dimmed, Eli was the high priest. So that he could not see, he was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out in the temple of the Lord. The light of God had not yet gone out in the house of God. In many places, there's barely a light 
flickering in some churches around the country. People are meeting like in little clubs. They're going for walks together. They're having meals together, they're having, which is all good stuff for fellowship. But that when the light of God truly burns, the love of God overflows from the house of God out into the community to influence the people, the old folks. People start to visit the hospitals, start visiting the old folks' homes, start visiting the prisons, start speaking in schools, and so on. I went to a school last week up in um, Mullah in County Cavan. And one of the kids, this kid, they were so impacted, they've invited me back again. But one of the kids got in touch with Classic Hits Radio. And the radio station was so impacted by the child that they phoned me. And I did a half an hour interview all over the country just from doing. So if some people want to get media to do stuff, maybe by visiting the schools, you get to speak to the whole nation. Now, just jump down to verse 7. Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So we know, um, you know, uh, uh, God was speaking to Samuel, and he hadn't yet learned to recognize the voice of God. And that's like the beginning of our Christian walks. You don't know the voice of God. You know, I, I remember when I met my wife, Tricia. I was driving through a town, and I felt God saying, stop your car and call into that little church in the corner. I wasn't sure it was God or not. You know, I was praying for a wife at the time. I was 40. And every girl that passed me by was a potential. Do you know that? You know what I mean? So, but this day God said to me, stop the car and call into that little church in the corner. So I wasn't sure it was God. Maybe kind of 50 percenter. You know, so I'll give it a shot. And if it's God, he'll confirm it to me. So I stopped the car and I called in. And there was a coffee morning on. It was Saturday morning. There was a coffee morning on. So this girl came over to me. And she was all right. This girl, this girl came over to me. And she said, would you like a cup of coffee? I'm only kidding. It's my sense of humor, all right? She was lovely. <laughs> all right. Okay, it's okay to have a sense of humor, you know. And um, she said, would you like a cup of coffee? And I had no money. I said, no money on me. She said, sit down. we get you one. So she went into the kitchen. So I looked, and there was another girl in the kitchen. So I was checking her out as well. <laughs> so, so the two of them came out, and they sat down. This was in Scotland. So they said, you're Irish. What are you doing over here? I said, oh, I run the rehab over in the island, a little island off the west coast of Scotland. I run a rehab. And I was in there. I, the, the, uh, the other girl that brought the, brought the cup of tea out for me was Tricia. And we got to know each other. And um, I'd written down 22 things that I was looking for in the woman I'd marry. Okay, number one, should I be a Christian? It's not that funny. <laughs> and, uh, so one, should I be a Christian? You know, uh, two, she had to be a little bit pretty, do you know what I mean? And uh, a healthy bloke. And, um, you know, and I, I wanted her to love the homeless and the broken and be willing to take them into our house together. That we'd be compatible like that with the call of God, the vision. And she'd be hungry for the word of God. So the word of God and vision would be, would be popular in our home, that we could work together with the word of God and vision, like in this, this, in this chapter. And um, I got to know Trisha. We became friends. And Trisha had four children. That wasn't one of the 22 things. <laughs> But I fell in love with the kids as well. And uh, we had a lot in common. And a year later, I invited her out to Loch Lomond. And we went out and we went for a, a meal together by the lake. And I was going to ask her to be my girlfriend. And uh, I was like 40 at the time, you know. And I was going to ask her to be my girlfriend. And I chickened out. And then we drove all the way home and I still hadn't asked her. And I felt a complete and total failure. And we got home then and she was just getting out of the car. And I said, Trisha, before you get out, I was going to ask her to be my girlfriend, but I got all befuddled and nervous and shy. And I said, I said, listen, Tricia, I said, um, I've fallen in love with you and I wonder if will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> and I realized what I said, oh my God. And she looked at me and she said, yes. Hey, come on. <laughs> We'd never even held hands or kissed. Now we're kissing all the time and holding hands. Okay, so I was single for 42 years, and overnight there were six of us. That was more traumatic than coming off heroin. No, I fell in love with the kids, and we've, we've been married 25 years now, happily married. We've traveled the world together, preaching the gospel, going on the streets. And uh, we're going around at the moment, not necessarily preaching in churches. You know, we're preaching on, we're going on the streets and we're helping the homeless and the broken. We're sitting in the gutter with them, buying them food, looking after them. So please buy a book. It'll go towards a sleeping bag. Or you can go on our website and help us to do that as well if you want to, walkingfree.org. So Samuel was learning how to hear the voice of God. And I'll just give that illustration to let you know what it's like. 
as you begin to hear the voice of God, step out in what you believe is probably God. And little by little, you begin to understand and hear and follow the voice of God. Because John 10, John 10 tells us, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. Okay, so just cut a long story short. I'll just run through this and just kind of come down here a little bit. Is that okay? So the story goes in, in 1 Samuel 3. That as Samuel went on growing in the Lord, that talking to Samuel, he began to hear the voice of God. And, and God told Samuel that Eli, the priest over Samuel, that his two sons were blaspheming God and they were partaking of the prostitutes down at the temple. They were living an ungodly life. And they were the protectors of the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. They were the ones that meant, were meant to be protecting it. And they were taking, there was offerings and, of, of meat and other things at the temple. And they, they were not meant to be partaking of it, but they took the best for themselves. They were trying to live a prosperous life by taking from the house of God for themselves. That's why I say, not a penny that will go in my pocket. It will go into helping people. Amen. It's not partaking of the fat of what God brings into the house for ourselves, but it's to distribute it to the poor and the lonely and the hurting and the dying. Amen. So Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's two sons, were living in an ungodly way, and they were also blaspheming the Lord. And then that moved on. And um, in, in chapter 4, as it moved on, so that was the atmosphere in the place. So the presence of God uh, wasn't being respected and wasn't being honored. In Leviticus chapter 10, it tells us that anybody who approaches God must consider him to be holy. And it means we must examine our lives. One of the great things that's missing about the presence of God in our churches today is the fear of the Lord is missing. Isaiah chapter 11 talks about the different spirits of God and one of them is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And we need to, if we're walking with God, we, we shouldn't be compelled by the evangelists to go on the streets. We should have a sense of the presence of God compelling us. Like Paul said, the love of God compels me. I was saying earlier, when I came over after the retreat in Scotland with the, with the addicts, we arrived in Belfast. I was exhausted. Trisha had to go home to look after some people that were looking after in her house. Trisha had to go home for a few days. So I came over to Ireland on my own, driving off the ferry in, Bel in Belfast. I was exhausted. And God's, I, on my heart, I felt there's somebody in Belfast I have to meet. So I was compelled by the love of God in me, not by a duty, not by, not by a ministry that you're going to put on Facebook or get, get known for, but the love of God compelled me to go on the streets. And I drove in, I found a parking space, and I walked around the streets, and I saw two young ladies standing in my shop window, and I felt the Holy Spirit saying, 80 percenter, they're the two. And I went over and said, hello, young ladies. And I, I started talking to them, and I gave them a try. And then suddenly I realized one of these girls is suicidal. It was like a word of knowledge began to operate. And I began to talk about my life. I said, at one time I was suicidal in my life. Because how do you broach a subject like that? I began to share my own testimony. One time I was so broken, I was suicidal in my life. I said, did you ever feel like that? And the tears came into the girl's eyes. I said, come on, honey. I said, I know what's wrong with you. I said, God has sent me to you today. I was coming off the boat and God said, go into Belfast. And she gave her life to Jesus there and then. I was there to pray for that young lady. It's the love of God that compels us. And when the love of God compels you, there's always fruit at the far end. But Hophni and Phileas, the love of God wasn't compelling them. It was a duty, it was a job that they could personally prosper in. And we've all seen that over the years. The excesses of prosperity on the land. I'm speaking today and saying, let's get back to basics again, to the job of the church, to bring the gospel to the lost, to those who are going to a lost eternity. They're not going to heaven. So if they're not going to heaven, where are they going? And we don't like to talk about that. These It's not politically correct. So that's the, that's the situation here. So then um, God spoke to Samuel and he said, tell Eli the consequences of him not correcting his family. And Samuel went to Eli, and Eli said, tell me all that the Lord has said. So Samuel told Eli, and he said, Eli, he said, this is going to come upon you. All these terrible things are going upon you. And, and Eli knew that the consequences of the way he was living and the way his sons were living, he knew that God was going to do it. He said, so let it be as God has said. So that's the situation. And then we come to chapter 4. 
And the word of the Lord through Samuel came to all Israel. Now through Samuel, the word of the Lord came to the whole country. Maybe through walking free ministries and revival. Maybe we can bring the word of the Lord to the whole of the country. But it's not going to happen unless we go to all 32 counties. So we bought a motorhome. Let's go to all 32 counties. Preach in every town. Reach all the homeless. We've invited the rich and the famous in. They're not coming. So let's go to the highways and byways. Let's invite the drug alleys and the drug dealers and the homeless and the prostitutes. Let's go to them and see we get a response from them and guess what they're giving their lives to Jesus so the word of the Lord the word of the Lord through Samuel came to all Israel now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines the Philistines is the world who knows the world is battling against the church at the moment a lot of stuff is who can feel something's wrong in the world who senses that something is amiss things are going who can sense something a bit strange about the war in the Ukraine it's not just a regular war. There's, some, there's something going on that we're not quite sure what it is. There's something happening. And now they begin to focus on China. They begin to focus on Russia. Now, in UK, where I live, are given tanks and airplanes and Poland and, and America's uh, Joe Biden's given loads of tanks and airplanes to the Ukraine. And begin, it's, it's got the potential of turning into the third world war. And we're whistling along, you know, going along and living our normal lives. And we're thinking, you know, oh, it'll go away, it'll go away. This is really happening under our noses. We're almost, a, I don't watch the mainstream media. I research alternative news to try and find out what's going around with the world. We got rid of our television. We don't have a television, we got rid of it. So we actually have the television, but we don't have a license. So we don't watch BBC or RT or any of those things. We're careful with what we put in front of us so that we can interpret the signs of the times. So here we have the Philistines drew up against Israel. And when the battle spread, Israel was smitten by the Philistines and they slew about 4,000 men on the battlefield. Now Hophni and Phinehas are sinning in the house of God. So the world has beaten the church in this situation. When the troops had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? So they're asking a question. Why is the church not prospering at this time? How is it the world is beating the church? Ephesians tells us, I don't really like the message translation, but some bits of it are genius. There's a bit in the message where it says, in, in Ephesians, I forget it, Ephesians chapter 2, I think, it says, it says um, the world is on the periphery of the church. Instead of the church being on the periphery of the world. But in many places I go, the church is on the periphery of the world. The more aligned to the ways of the world with their seeker friendly, uh, putting the power of God on the shelf and, you know, not speaking in tongues or not, not talking about the things of the gifts of the spirit and not, not doing, out, not doing outreach, but tr more trying to be relevant, more trying to be contemporary in today's society, that we be acceptable to the world. And so the, word, the church ends up being on the periphery of the world and the world sneaks in and they lose their power. And I've watched these churches close up and down the nation. It's just been absolutely crazy. So the, so, so the Philistines, be, so they say, why were we smitten today? So they said, let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from, the, from Shiloh that, we may, that the presence of God may come amongst us and save us from the power of our enemies. So they realized, oh, it's the presence of God that we need back in our midst. If we have the presence of God, that'll be sufficient to see the enemy beaten. So people want the presence of God, so they're always praying, come Holy Spirit. They'll have me prayer meetings and different things. So did the presence of God happen? So the people went out to Shiloh and brought there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts. So the presence of God was back. right? And when the presence of God, when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, verse 5, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth resounded. When the presence of God came back in the camp, there's a particular revival happening in America at the moment. I forget, what's the name of the place? Asbury. Asbury. There's a particular revival happening. The whole world is rejoicing. The presence of God is back. The presence of God is back. But Hophni and Phinehas are still in the camp. Sin is still in the camp. Although they have the presence of God, but is the presence of God going to be sufficient to bring revival? Well, let's see what happens. So when the Philistines heard the noise of the Israelites shouting because the presence of God was back, verse 6, they said, what does this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? When they understood that the, ark, then they under, they understood that the ark of the covenant had come back into the camp. The Philistines, the world, realized the presence of God is back in the camp. It's back in the church. So the world was terrified, 
But somebody wise in the world says, says to them, Be strong, he said to the Philistines, and acquit yourselves like men, O you Philistines, and that you may not become servants to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Behave yourselves like men and fight. So the world fought even stronger when the presence of God began to manifest in the church. The world fought even stronger. And that day, verse 10, they slew 30,000 foot, foot soldiers of the Israelites. 30,000 of them were destroyed, even though they had the presence of God back. So interpret that in the new times, in, the, in these end times that we're in. The presence of God is not sufficient to keep the enemy away from your camp. Shouting great shouts. Let's give a shout to the Lord on a Sunday morning. It's not sufficient to see the victory. So they slew 30,000 foot soldiers. And the ark of God was taken, captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were killed. The people in sin were killed. The consequence, the word that Samuel brought to Eli was fulfilled that day. And the people who were sinning were dealt with by God. That should bring the fear of God upon people. The fear I'm talking about is a reverential fear, not a terror like I used to have as a kid, thinking God's got a big stick wanting to beat me for me doing wrong. It's by grace we're saved through faith. Amen. So the people went to Shiloh and brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts who dwells between the chairmen. So they, 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 they stole the Ark of the Covenant. They brought it back. And then some servants went to Eli, told him, the ark has been stolen and your two sons have been killed. And Eli, the high priest, who was a big fat man at that time, he fell off a seat, broke his neck and he died. And just after that, um, his daughter-in-law, Phineas, his wife, was with child, about to be delivered. And when she heard that the ark of God was captured, I'm reading from verse chapter 4, verse 19. And when she heard that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed, she bowed herself and gave birth for her pains, her pains of childbirth came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman attending her said to her, Fear not, for you were born a son. But she did not answer or notice. She died. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God has been captured, and because of the father-in-law and her husband. She said, The glory is gone from Israel, for the ark of God has been taken. What a, what a frightening story. That the presence of God will be taken. The high priests, the ones who were meant to be in charge of the temple of God, were not ushering back the presence of God the way it needed to be. Do you understand this? You have the presence of God in this church. The world is attacking the church. We have in our schools, we have teachings in our schools to our children that are like doctrines of Baal, where they're teaching about gender confusion. I have hear enough so many kids these days coming up to their mommy and daddy saying, I think I'm this or I think I'm that. I'm not going to go into it this morning, the children here. But there's confusion coming in. And, they're, 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 and, and, and a lot of the time, the church is standing idly by. We need to be active in these things right into our TDs. Well, the voice of the church needs to be heard. They shouted when the presence of God came back, but because there was sin in the camp, they weren't heard. Let's purify ourselves, get ourselves right, back right with God again. Let us get back right doing evangelism, reaching the elderly of our communities, going into the old folks' homes, getting into our schools and preaching to our children. Let us get children even in our, our alpha groups, our life groups, and start, te start teaching from the basics of the Bible again, going back to teaching doctrine. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen. God created them male and he created them female. And he said, go forth and multiply. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. We need to really get back to it again. And I know that you probably all do here. So I'm just doing like what Paul said to Timothy. I'm fanning into flame what's already within you. Amen. Amen. And I'll just finish with this. I'll finish with this from um, Matthew chapter 25. If, if we're living this way, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened... Oh, no, a bit further down, sorry. In the end times, verse 23 of, of um, Matthew 25... 
All nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them, the people, from one another, as the shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. And he will cause the sheep to stand at his right hand, but the goats at his left. We're sheep, yeah? My sheep will hear my voice. What does the sheep look like? We know what a sheep looks like. We know the noise it makes. We know what it eats. And he will cause the sheep to stand at his right, but the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you are blessed by my father. You favored and appointed to eternal salvation. Inherit and receive as your own the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the earth. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. This is what the love of God causes us to do. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you brought me together with yourselves and welcomed and entertained and lodged me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me with help and ministering care. I was in prison and you came to see me. This is a mirror image of what the church should be doing. Then the just and upright will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and give you food or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome and entertain you or naked and clothed you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come and visit you? And the king will reply to them and say to them, truly I tell you, insofar as you did it for the least of these in the estimation of men of these, my brethren, you did it for me. When we're ministering to people, we're ministering unto the Lord. And then he goes on and he said, he said to the, to the goats on, 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 his, on his left, he said, he said, he said and they said, when did we see you and, and not feed you? He said, when you did not do it to, unto the least of these, you did not do it unto me. So outreach is about ministering unto Jesus. Mm. It's the love of God that compels us as we reach out into the streets of Ireland. We need to have a big vision. Kilkenny can be taken. If 12 disciples, if 12 apostles can come together and turn the world upside down in the book of Acts. And if they had everything in common, when we see a need, we and our team, we talk, how can we meet that need? We'll chip in our personal money, we'll chip in our ministry money, and we'll do what we can to meet that need. All up and down the country we do it. And when we come to work in the church, we have our own finances, our own pockets to do that. And we don't ask the churches for anything. Um, we don't ask for the church for anything. The churches do support us, and we praise God for that. But we do it. Because the love of God compels us. So just to pull it together, what I've shared today is, people think the presence of God, a revival in a place like Asperg, is a great sign of God moving. Yes, the presence of God is moving, but it's not sufficient to have the presence of God in our churches. If when we marry the presence of God with action, and we minister unto the Lord by ministering to our communities in Kilkenny. Kilkenny has many people committing suicide, I'm sure. Kenny, I'm walking around and I see many people on drugs. We met drug addicts yesterday. We will leave copies of the, the thing with the rehabs in it. You can feel free to photocopy that. And I think that every drug addict in, in Kilkenny needs to get one of these, that they can make a decision to turn their lives around. But if we can sincerely and honestly just think and examine ourselves and say, Father, let me be a person who's truly walking in your presence and takes personal responsibility for the town I live in, that I will feel for the elderly. Give me a burden for the elderly. Give me a burden for the single mums. Look at single mums around the place, bringing up children on their own. Some of them haven't got enough money for food or for nappies or for other things. How about the church meeting that need? Having a ministry in your church. We used to have a box in our church, and uh, people would put money in it, and it was used to do these kind of things. And my prayer is that up and down this country, as we travel around the 32 counties, that some people will catch this. And you'd probably prefer, prefer if I came and just gave my testimony and excited you all and gave a nice word. But sometimes we need to hear a word like this, that there's people out there waiting. That's why God came to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And he said, Moses, I have heard the cry of my people and I've come to do something about it. God has heard the cry of the elderly, of the addicted, of the young single moms who are getting abused by men, who are getting pregnant, and all these things happening. And they're praying, God, if you're there, please help me. How are they going to receive God's help unless the church mobilizes itself once again? Amen. Amen. So I pray, Father, that today in Jesus' mighty name, number one, I pray that your church, Lord, I pray for an impartation of evangelism to come upon people. They don't have to do what Trisha and I do, but they can do their little bit. Give them a burden for the old person on their street. 
Give them a burden for the local old folks' home. Give them a burden for the addicts and the homeless. Help them buy sleeping bags and hats and gloves and hand warmers. And make sure that the homeless in Kilkenny or wherever they are, that at least in this town they're warm, that they have a tent to sleep in, that they, look, that they have the addresses of rehabilitation centers. We can change this town, Lord God, with this small army of people in this room. Help us, Father God, to receive this word. Help the people receive it, not say, oh, John brought a hard word this morning. It's not about that, Lord God. It takes courage to speak like this. And I pray, Lord, even as the worship band comes up and just to play in the background, I pray, Father, that impartation will come upon them. Who would like to help the broken in Kilkenny? Okay, can I ask, as we, are we going to play something here now, are we? Can I ask if you really want an impartation to come up here and let me lay a hand upon you and maybe Dermot and thing will join me. Come on up here and let us just pray with you. Come on. Come on, for you want to you want to reach people in your town, your street. It should be everybody in the church. We're Christians, and while people are coming forward here, as you're listening to my voice, there might be some people in here this morning who are visiting for the first time, and you've never had an encounter with the presence of God. Just make room for people to come around the side here. You might never have invited Jesus Christ into your life to be your Lord and Savior. That's what this is about. God so loved the world, He sent His only Son, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but would have eternal life. Come on, keep coming forward. Give me a bit more room here in the front. Just come closer to me. And maybe get a, a second line there as well. God so loved the world, He sent His only Son. He says, if you will invite Jesus Christ into your life to be your Lord and Savior, your name will be written in heaven. That's not my opinion. That's what the Bible says. Jesus Christ died, He shed His blood so your sin could be forgiven. He rose again so that when we taste death, we, won't, we just go straight through death into heaven. Not into purgatory or limbo, but straight into heaven. That's what the Bible says. If there's somebody here this morning in this room that would like to receive Jesus Christ for the first time into their life or give their lives back to you. Anybody in this room, just put your hand up and put it back down again that I can pray with you. Anybody like to receive Jesus Christ into their heart, to be their Lord and Savior. Anybody, put your hand up and put it back down again. I'm just looking around here. Okay, I see it. Well done, love. Anybody else in this room? Okay, praise God. Anybody else in this room? There's two ladies, put their hands up. Anybody else in this room? Okay, Dermot, uh, Der uh, maybe one of you guys go over there, one over here, I'll do in the middle. Father, we call on heaven today. In Jesus' name, we pray in faith and humility. We pray, Lord God, that today will be a day that marks the beginning of individuals doing outreach in Kilkenny, that the old folks, the single moms, that the addicts, the homeless, the broken, the businesses, the people going bankrupt, that today will be the beginning of the anointing of God coming upon your church. Let the voices of these people be released. Help them, anoint them with power and might, Lord God. Touch them, Father God. Damn it, go for it. Touch them, Father God, in Jesus' mighty name. We impart, Father God, evangelism to them. Healing of all brokenness within them, Lord God. Anointing upon them, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Just go where you want to. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Impartation. And bring freedom and liberty to them all, Lord God. Freedom and liberty to them all, Lord God. You as well, Trish. Now you got the baby, you're all right. Thank you, Jesus. Emma.